Hi there and welcome back. In this video I will talk a little bit about William Carlos Williams and HD or Hilda Doolittle. Um, William Carlos Williams was a poet of the modernist movement and he had some very specific ideas of what modernism should be and was one of the early uh, adapters and co-creators of a form of modernist poetry known as imagism. I put a quotation under his name there, and that quotation basically um, suggests that to have poetry work and move forward, it shouldn't be about abstractions, about things just lost in the mind or emotion. All ideas should be in physical, concrete things. And it's from the physical world of materiality we get to larger ideas and states of mind and states of emotion and states of spirituality. Eh, spirituality, eh, not really his bag. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Now, uh, what is uh, really interesting about him is that he is of very diverse backgrounds, including uh, Dutch, Puerto Rican, English, and French Basque ancestry. So he's he once again is showing that increasing diversity in American literature. And he worked as a pediatrician all his life. That was his day job. He wrote poetry at night and just happened to be discovered by Ezra Pound and a couple of other modernists. Ezra Pound was a poet in his own right, but he's more better known as a networker, someone who connects uh, upcoming poets, interesting poets with each other, and also connects them to patrons and to funding. He's kind of like a, a, a modernism literary agent. He's like the Ari Gold, if you watch that show. Um, I forget the name of it. But anyway, um, some of that kind of clinical, physical uh, mindset of being a doctor does make his way into his poetry. And yes, he is the best known member of the Imagism movement. And so what he is known for is making very precise and exact images. Like that has to be at the core of any other idea or state of mind that he uh, wants to get across. Um, there's also a lot of compression, um, tightness, in other words, no wasted words, common speech, or that vernacular that we talked about before. Doesn't have to be that high university style. And also looser rhyme schemes, if there are rhyme schemes at all. Um, he works a lot in free verse. Now, some of the poems we look at today will be very focused on image. Uh, and the importance of image. The red wheelbarrow is one of them, um, where you will notice that imagery takes, physical imagery takes the forefront, and it's up to you to draw the conclusion, well, what is it depends that that, uh, that what is that so much that depends on that red wheelbarrow? Think about where the line breaks are too, and how that changes your reading. Another one where he does have a lot of imagism involved is going to be the poem called Spring and All. And it's talking about, you know, these very physical elements of spring erupting from this cold, wet environment. So that too is super important. The other thing that I will say is that there are a couple poems that are less in that style, but are but are still worth us looking at. Um, this is just to say is a very conversational poem about um, taking somebody's breakfast, and to Elsie does have a lot of imagist, uh, stylistic uh, emphasis in it. Even though it's talking about um, a person, a lot of what we know about that person and the ideas and emotional states surrounding that person, both by her and through um, Williams himself, come through these concrete images, these very physical, actual images. Um, interesting story. Elsie was actually 
um, a young woman, actually a late teen, who um, worked as a housekeeper. And there is a very curious kind of class uh, analysis. You can even go so far as to say class condescension going on in that poem. And if you look at that through, say, like a Marxist critical lens, um, we'll find some very curious, if not outright disturbing, kind of class condescension, class fetishism in a way. And also, you know, a relationship of like, how gender works in relationship to class, or at least through misguided um, apprehensions or view, viewings of it. All good stuff, though. Hard to forget. And he's also seen as somebody in that next poetic gene, genealogical, genealogical, excuse me, genealogical line of American voice and American verse that started with Walt Whitman. Whitman, he comes off as you know that next important uh, generation of truly American voiced poets. So enjoy. Um, oh look, here's a younger picture of him. Kind of looks like Wesley Crusher, right? I don't know why I put that in there. So here's our definition of imagism. I pretty much set it all out in uh, the opening slide for Williams. It's a poetic style. We can call it a movement um, that employs the language of common speech. You're definitely going to see that. Creates new kinds of rhythms. It doesn't have to be that regular, um, very tight or predictable rhythm that we see in 19th century poetry and earlier. Um, has complete freedom in subject matter. We'll certainly see that and presents a clear, concentrated, and precise image. The only way you're going to get to ideas or emotional states is through building that tight, sharp, clear image. Now, moving right along. Oh, we have an, another example of imagism from Ezra Pound. I already talked about Pound a little bit here in a station of the Metro. And here's the whole poem. Strap yourselves in, it's really long. The apparition of these black faces, oh, excuse me, let me start again. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough. So, what's the deal here? This is another example of imagism because it's got at its focus a very hard concrete image. It's got petals, from a flower on a wet black bough, which gives you a sense of um, its uh, reference to nature and crowdedness, but also to a sense of uh, moist density. If you've ever been in like a subway station underground, um, they can get kind of steamy and humid at points, especially if you're like on the East Coast in summer. Um, so it helps you understand this. Now, a little story about how this poem was created. Pound is well known for writing big, big, long poems. And he's got a whole poetic cycle called the Cantos. Um, it goes through all these various subjects. I won't talk too much about that. So how Pound started this poem is he, he made this big old long poem about how he saw these faces in this crowd at the metro, at, at the subway. Uh, metro in general is more of a European term for subway. Um, here's an expatriate. You know, we talked about expatriates before. Pound spent a lot of his time in Paris. So, big old long poem. He just kept on cutting out lines and cutting out lines and cutting out lines and cutting out lines until finally he came down to this. Now, some of you are thinking, well, why does this get to be in the book? Why does this get to be famous? Uh, I could have written that. That's tiny. Um, it's a really good point. But the more we move into the 20th century, the more we expect writers to be able to elaborate at great lengths on their work and to do so um, tirelessly and with great precision 
um, and thoughtfulness and an almost theoretical bent. And we see that a lot in contemporary art too. You know, some of the art looks like it's incredibly easy to make, but for the people that do get in galleries or start to make a name within the art world, it's about being able to talk about the work too. So yeah, there's a certain self-reflexiveness we see in 20th century literary creation and artistic creation. Yeah, you, if you've got a famous artist um, or like a favorite artist that's from the 20th century, last 50 years or so, or even earlier, look online. Um, you can probably find videos of them talking about their art or look up essays that they wrote about their own art or what art means to them in general. And the same with literature too. So there's that. Now we're coming up to HD. Hilda Doolittle, Hilda, Hilda, wow, I'm killing it. Hilda Doolittle. Now, HD was uh, suggested that moniker by none other than Ezra Pound. You know, she too is part of the Ezra Pound Club. And he said, shorten it up. Just go by HD and put at the end of it, imagiste, like the word imagist with the E on the end, because that would be how the French would write it. And a couple things there. First of all, it attaches her to a movement, makes her sound more specific. Secondly, and I don't think this is, this is coincidental, hides her gender. This is still a very male biased field. And Ezra Pound, for all his competence and knowledge, was not exactly a social progressive. He was a bit of a chauvinist pig, a bit of a racist, a bit of an anti-Semite as well. Um, but he did help to get uh, poets and writers together and connected to funding and to critical reception. We see this a lot in the 20th century. Uh, we see this in the art world too. And she definitely is one of these core members. Um, and like I just said there, I'm always beating my slides here. Ezra Pound coined her nom de plume. Her feather name basically means her pen name. And you translate the French into English. And she, her verse does tend to paint pictures. And uh, the words that she uses to paint these pictures will get you into a certain mindset or an emotional state. And oh, there goes my phone. I'm going to pause this for a sec. Okay, I'm back. Um, yes, to answer your question, I do have a landline at my house. Um, basically, if... Uh, the power goes out and if your cell phone isn't working or cell towers are down because there's a, uh, an emergency and like a national or like a, an earthquake or something like that, landline can be a good thing to have. It's about eight bucks a month. Whatever. Who cares? Nobody calls us on it except robocallers. All right. And so anyway, what I was also saying here at the end was... Um, these images sometimes take precedent over a narrative, that plot structure that is so familiar to us as Western readers. That exposition, rising tension, climax, decreasing tension, and resolution. There's ambiguity in multiple meanings that challenge um, very straightforward interpretations to our poetry or conclusive ones, ones that, you know, give you a sense of finality. And remember that ambiguity is really important. And if you look at Oread, that tiny little poem, it's talking about waves of fir trees. Um, so it's almost like it's about uh, woodsy mountains also being the ocean. Is it both at the same time? Is it either or is it neither? So it's making you shift back and forth between perspectives rapidly. Very nice, very tight little poem. Um, some of you have probably seen that uh, drawing of the rabbit head that also looks like a duck's head at the same time. And your mind is shuttling back through, back and forth between uh, the meaning or making meaning out of that image. Same thing happens in her poetry, but with, a, with words instead of a picture. She's also very well known for challenging male-dominated subject matter. Um, she was a very early um feminist in the uh modernist poetry movement and 
even though she really, really digs classical Greek literature. Oh, looks like we're going to have to stop here. I'll finish in the next one.